Welcome everyone to the Base Yaakov Centennial webinar. I am privileged to be here with Naomi Seidman and Talia Weisberg. Uh, Naomi Seidman is a graduate of the Base Yaakov of Borough Park and Base Yaakov Academy. She is currently the Coret Professor of Jewish Culture at the Graduate Theological Union. And um, Talia Weisberg is with us. She uh, also went to a Beis Yaakov school and um, followed by Harvard University, where she studied religion and women's studies. And she is now working at the um, at the consulate, um, sorry, at the Israeli consulate in New England. Uh, so thank you both so much for joining us. Um, we're so happy to have you. And uh, if you could just start off by telling us a little bit about your research and uh, your connection to, to Beis Yaakov and how you got into this. Who goes first? You can. <laughs> Talia, do you want, why don't you go first? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, so as Rivka said, I um, did go to a Beis Yaakov High School. Um, I was raised more in the Mount Orthodox community, so my foray into the Beis Yaakov world was an interesting experience for me and one that really um, stuck with me even through my time as an undergrad at Harvard, um, where I graduated in May. Um, and it was, my, my experience at Beis Yaakov was one that I really enjoyed and was one um, that definitely posed its difficulties, but was overall a positive experience for me. Um, but one of those difficulties that really stuck with me was kind of how to balance being like a, a, a good from girl while also engaging in secular education, going to Harvard, the secular institution of America, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, how to kind of uh, balance those parts of my identity. And um, when I when it was time to uh, write a senior honors thesis, uh, writing about Beis Yaakov seemed like a very um, obvious thing to me. It was something that I was very interested in from a personal and academic perspective, um, which I think is a really good motivation to write about things, in, at least in my opinion. Um, so that was, I guess, what kind of led me to um, write my senior honors thesis um, about the Beis Yaakov movement, um, which kind of traces the history of it going, from, like my first chapter is about the movement in Europe and how Sarah Schneer founded it and kind of the historical context in terms of women's education and, and the Orthodox community in Europe um, and how she kind of revolutionized the way um, Orthodox religious education um, was accessible for um, various parts of the Orthodox community in a way that they hadn't been before. Um, and then my second chapter focused on the uh, transformation of the movement in its transplantation to the U.S. Um, post-Holocaust world and kind of all the interesting ways the early um, women of American Beis Yaakov um, interpreted Sarah Schneer's um, message and methodology in Europe into the American context. Um, and then my third chapter, which is the really fun part, is the part that um, explores the um, engagement of the movement um, and it, the ways that like Jofa and Yeshivat Maharat um, kind of connect themselves into this narrative of expanding Orthodox girls' formal religious education and um, the way, especially Yeshivat Maharat, um, kind of um, discusses itself as the kind of natural, kind of like logical conclusion of Orthodox girls' education. Um, so I guess that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I went to Beis Yaakov, obviously a long time before Talia did. Um, and Beis Yaakov Elementary School and High School came from a very Beis Yaakov identified family. My father was on the Beis Yaakov board. Um, and I left orthodoxy at the age of 18 and um, did not think about Beis Yaakov for uh, quite a while. And the way I got involved in thinking about Beis Yaakov again was that I was in um, 
I was in Krakow for the Jewish Culture Festival with a group of graduate students from Berkeley. Um, and I saw a group of Beis Yaakov girls. And of course I could tell a group of Beis Yaakov girls a mile off. Um, and they couldn't identify me though. And um, I went over to them and I said, are you in town for the festival? And they said, no, we're in town to visit the grave of the founder of our movement. And I said, you mean Sarah Schneerer? They looked at me like, who are you? And they said, yes. And I uh, was thinking about it and it just seemed to me very interesting. And about a few hours later, I bumped into the director of the festival and I said, did you know that there's a pilgrimage of adolescent girls probably going between seminaries in Israel and home in New York who are coming to Poland and visiting the grave of Sarah Schneer, the founder of Beis Yaakov. And he said, I didn't know. Um, and I said, and, you know, people know about Hasidic pilgrimage. They know about heritage tourism. They know that people come to the festival. Do you know that Krakow is the center of yet another kind of pilgrimage? And he said, that's really interesting. Why don't you talk about it at next year's festival? So I went home and started reading everything I could about Beis Yaakov, especially in Krakow and then to war period, and discovered that the only real sort of attempt to, to write a history, a book-length history of the, of the movement was published in 1937 by my father. I had no idea. He never mentioned it. Um, anyway, I gave the talk at the next uh, year's festival. I was hoping some Beis Yaakov girls would show up, but none of them did. And there was someone in the audience who said, I'm the editor of a series on Eastern European Jewry and called Littman Library, and we want you to turn this into a book. So that's what I've been doing. My book is a, a history of Beis Yaakov in the interwar period. It's also a translation of Sarah Schneer's collected writings, which have never been translated into English in their entirety. Um, her diary surfaced a few months ago, and um, it's going to be published in translation. I wasn't allowed to translate it in full, but I cite from it. Um, and I think it's really going to be, I hope, I mean, I don't know how it will be accepted in the movement, but uh, I, it's, it, it's uh, really the first book-length academic treatment of Desiakov since my father's. And um, I'm very curious to know how, how, what, what kind of resonance it might have in the Orthodox world. And I was really happy to find out about Talia's work just as I was finishing up. Wow, that sounds really incredible. I can't wait for the book to come out. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so first question that I wanted to, to ask you both. Um, and I guess I'll direct this at Naomi first. Um, so if, if you think that, um, the Beis Yaakov movement was a success, uh, why, why do you think that it was so successful? And was it really the first time, um, that there was an attempt to create widespread education for Orthodox girls? So it wasn't the first, even though it saw itself as the first. Uh, it, it depends what you call the first. I mean, it's firsts are always hard to determine historically. You can point to, in the Orthodox world, in the modern period, you can point to the fact that in the 1850s, Samson Raphael Hirsch in uh, Germany provided a rigorous Jewish education for girls and for boys. Um, in the Real Shula that um, taught girls pretty much everything that the boys were learning other than Talmud, which of course is still the case in Beis Yaakov, so that the Talmud is a bridge too far. It's not taught in Beis Yaakov. Um, but even in Eastern European Orthodoxy, there was a girls' school system founded a year before Beis Yaakov called Chavat Selet. Um, I think Talia probably knows about this. Um, and the same years that Sarah Schneira was founding her Beis Yaakov, the Yavne in Lithuania was setting up schools for girls and for boys. And the girls' schools were 
extremely rigorous, I would say more so than Beis Yaakov, more so especially, you know, the, the, the high schools were particularly impressive. I think what Beis Yaakov had going for it was a female founder and a female founder with the charisma of Sarah Schneer, uh, the charisma and really unique religious vision. She really was a, I mean, she's, when the talk about her being a simple seamstress is so upsetting to me. I so fell in love with Sarah Schneer while I was mm -hmm. working on, on this project. And she was a, a religious thinker, really, of the first order. And um, a, along with being a, a genius for social organization, uh, with having a genius for social organization, Vesiakov had um, is so much more to offer than anything that was going on in German neo-Orthodoxy, even if it borrowed a lot from that uh, field. And it had more to offer than what was going on in Yavna. It was a completely female-centric world, um, especially in the small towns. Um, men played a greater role in, in the big city schools. But um, yes, I think, I think it was a success. It wasn't, a, it wasn't near, nearly as successful as they hoped. Um, they actually projected bigger numbers than Sarsner, than they managed to accomplish. Um, in the 30s. But nevertheless, I mean, 200 schools in small towns, schools in the major cities of Eastern Europe, um, trade schools, professional teacher professionalization programs, three teacher seminaries, um, an inter a, 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 a student body that was increasingly drawing um, the most talented girls from all over the Jewish world. Um, and it was expanding already in the 30s to other places. And uh, I, I, it's very hard to see how you, you can't call it a success. I mean, when people say that it saved 20th century orthodoxy, I think that that's not an exaggeration. Thank you. Talia, what are your thoughts on the matter? So, I mean, I definitely agree with basically everything Naomi just said in terms of uh, Sarah Schneer's um, kind of leadership abilities and uh, resultant successes. Um, to kind of add a little bit to one point Naomi made, I think a lot of the power of Beis Yaakov was that it was a by women for women movement, um, which is not to downplay the role of the very many talented, pious men who, who were involved with the, with the Beis Yaakov movement as, as teachers and administrators, um, and who were very beloved by um, students and, and uh, teachers alike. Um, but to say that, generally speaking, Sarschner was the figurehead of the movement and the teachers were the vast majority women and obviously the students were women as well. And I think that, um, I mean, I know sisterhood is powerful was very much not a uh, tagline that Sarschner would have been familiar with seeing as it only came up in radical feminist circles in the late 60s. Um, but I really do think that it's um, something that would have resonated with Schneer, and I think that her creating the Basiakov movement as like a by women for women thing was intentional and um, part of the reason why she was able to foster such success, um, especially in the Eastern European context beyond the kind of just logistical like, well, girls can't learn Gamara, so they can't have co-education and like the general kind of societal impropriety sense of uh, boys and girls mingling in a classroom. Um, and I also, I think, would say that um, an important part of Sarah Schneer's Beis Yaakov and even Beis Yaakov in later years was the inclusion of girls from all socioeconomic classes. Um, I think that the general trend in um, Jewish education, um, formal at least Jewish education, throughout Jewish history was that it was always much more accessible from um, a the upper classes, people who were wealthy, and one of the, and Sarchner as someone who was is, um, not in a high socioeconomic class, I think was particularly motivated to make sure that Beis Yaakov to affordable as possible, and even for those girls who, because their family was poor such that they couldn't, um, they couldn't go to school, um, had the option to go to the, the the training programs that Naomi mentioned and had the options to um, go to Binos youth groups like on 
or after they came home from work. Um, and even the Basiakov Journal, um, which was published from 1923, like basically until the eve of the Holocaust, really interesting articles. Um, I was able to read some while doing my research. And like, there were articles that ranged from like translations of the week's Haftorah to um, articles about Gandhi, which is like, who thinks of that, you know, like in relation to Basiakov, but that they, they uh, so I, I think, I guess that is also, I think, an important part of Basiakov that we don't often think about is, is that it, it was a very accessible movement for girls from kind of every part of the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, and I think that's also even in the American system, um, often the case as well, that Basiakov's, I mean, due to the like general um, socioeconomic class of the more community tend to, um, and also the sense of like the need for a Jewish education, um, tend to also be more accepting of girls um, who do not come from higher up socioeconomic classes. Can I add one thing to that? Yes, of course. So um, it's interesting to think that Sarah, what, what Sarah Schneer would have thought about the phrase sisterhood is powerful. Mm -hmm. And what, ma what that made me think of is that Sarah Schneer herself was usually talked about as the mother of the movement. In other words, what was being inscribed was a kind of, uh, to cover over the fact that, that Besyakov was such a radical new social institution, it had to be recast as a new form of the traditional home. And thus, Sarah Schneerer was the mother who, and the students were her daughters. But she herself, as far as I know, never, spoke about herself as the mother of Beis Yaakov, except when she was speaking about the youngest girls. And along with Benos, there was Basia. Um, when she spoke to Benos leaders or Benos members, and when she spoke to um, teachers in Beis Yaakov, she, as far as I know, almost always talked to them as her sisters. So she would begin her letters to them or her speeches to them with my dear sisters. Um, and as I think it's the case that she felt herself to be part of a sisterhood movement rather than one that she uh, played the role of mother as. And in her diaries, she talks very explicitly about wanting to do something for and with her sisters. She wasn't even sure whether she wanted to be in the Orthodox community, strikingly. But what she did know was that she wanted to work with her sisters. She actually thought about moving to Chicago because she thought it might be easier to do that in the United States. Um, but her, her rhetoric was quite explicitly, I don't know what to call it, sisterly. And in that regard, I mean, I don't know if, if that mean, that's the same thing as saying it's feminist, but she was very against traditional hierarchies. And when uh, at Benos meetings, she would deliberately not speak in order to allow um, the girls to speak. And what happened in the Beis Yaakov seminaries was that girls were encouraged to take on teaching roles with each other very quickly. At every dinner, one girl would stand up and recite the day's news, a summary of the day's news. And on Shabbos, there was a, a, a you know a, a, a teaching that was given by one of the girls. Um, and she encouraged the spirit of cooperation. I mean, the schools all had, as Talia was saying, um, there was an interest also, I would call it quasi-socialist in uh, pooling property and providing. So, so the schools had cooperatives for school supplies and for dresses. And one of the reasons why Tu Ba'av was such a beloved holiday in Beis Yaakov was because of its association with the story of girls wearing each other's dresses um, so that the rich and the poor would not be differentiated at sight. So that was certainly part of Beis Yaakov culture it, in the interwar period. And it's interesting to think about whether that's true today too. I think that's probably one of the reasons for the Beis Yaakov uniform. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so going off of um, something that you we're saying about was Sarah Schneer feminist? Uh, I wanted to ask um, how was and is Beis Yaakov uh, influenced by different modern cultural 
influences and movements, um, including and but not limited to feminism. Why don't we start with Talia this time? Sure. Sure. Um, so when I was in 10th grade, um, my high school put on a production called Letters from Krakow, which was about um, the advent of the Basiakov movement um, in, in the interwar years. And um, one of the, uh, I think it was the first dance, it was called the, the ISM dance. And in the ISM dance, um, there's uh, like communists, Zionists, and feminists. And all these groups were like, like supposed to indicate like, the point of the dance was to say like, oh, these are the causes that are taking our girls from the shuls into the streets, into the clubhouses, whatever. Um, and the, the play is very um, strongly based off of Pearl Danish's um, biography of Schneer, one of uh, Schneer's students in Europe who uh, went on to write a biography called Carry Me in Your Heart. Um, and in Pearl Danish's book, she frequently references communism, socialism, and Zionism as two movements that took that that were taking girls off the derech as as we say now, um, but she doesn't say she doesn't say feminism anywhere. She doesn't anywhere in the book reference like women's live or or the women's movement or anything like that. Um, so my high school, I, I whoever wrote the screen the the script, I guess, that was a really interesting um, choice to make, um, and I think that a big indicator of uh, kind of the way that a lot of contemporary based Yaakov's feminism that like on one hand, at least I, maybe Naomi's experience would uh, mirror this, I, I don't know, but I know that my experience in based Yaakov was very like, we celebrate feminism because it empowers women to go into the workforce and have equality so we can support our husbands as they learn in Kolel. Um, which is not necessarily congruent ideas, I think interesting um, way of, of thinking about feminism as a, a way to kind of support the traditional Jewish home. Um, if, I mean, the idea of a wife supporting her husband in Kolel is a traditional idea in, in any way. Um, so I, my, my point being, I think that at least contemporary Beis Yaakov really um, has a hard time figuring out exactly what it, um, exactly whether or not feminism is a good movement overall. Um, I know that in my um, research on the kind of older years of the American based Yaakov movement, Vichna Kaplan, who um, was the one who brought over from Europe, um, very much wrote at least in things um, in, in a way that was very skeptical of feminism and felt kind of threatened by feminism as an assault on like the traditional Jewish home. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, as far as I know, I mean, Naomi probably would know better. I don't know that Sarah Schneer ever used the word feminist. I don't know if feminism would have meant anything to her as a movement. Um, I know it was not super popular among uh, Jewish women in Poland as a category. Um, so I, I generally kind of struggle with applying kind of these contemporary labels on people who don't, who it wouldn't have necessarily meant anything to. But I... I, I am generally inclined to think that what Sarah Schneer accomplished was a feminist goal, um, but I'm loath to apply it, apply the label to her just because I don't know that it would have been a meaningful label for her. I think I thought that when I started my research too, that feminism is not, was not really a current label. And to some extent that's true, that uh, what things like Zionism and socialism, communism, um, were much more, much stronger movements than um, feminism. But those movements tended to have women's associations. And there actually were, one of the things I discovered in my research is that there was quite a lot of um, open, what I would call feminist activity going on. I mean, there was a, um, a Warsaw Women's Monthly called um, Freienstimm, um, that was uh, devoted to Jewish women's uh, topics. And it, Sarah Schneer's speech at the opening of Neshea Agudas Yisrael, which she was one of the founders of, the Women's Association of the Aguda, seems to be in direct conversation with their, um, their issues, um, especially the, the, the issues that Beis Yaakov was, and Beis Yaakov was actually involved with, 
some of these international women's organizations. So for instance, it, it, if Reinstein was very involved in the Aguna question, their first issue was devoted to the Aguna. Sarah Nera wrote about how there are women out there saying that we don't care about Agunot. Of course we care about Agunot. We all care, men and women, but if there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do. She knew very well what women were saying. In that particular issue of the Freienstim, they talked about um, how if the women, if rabbis can find ways to allow uh, Jews to sell their, uh, you know, to sell their chametz on Pesach, why can't they find ways around the problem of the Aguna? So these are women working with halachic sources. There were other women who were uh, either had orthodox educations or orthodox background who were wielding halachic arguments to uh, in, in much more sophisticated ways than I just uh, uh, described to argue for the rights of agunas in uh, after World War I. That was a major problem. Aside from that, Sarah Schneer also had uh, personal contacts with uh, well-known feminists, especially around um, the international white slave trade, which was uh, the, um, uh, you know, this was one of the things that women, especially Jewish women all around the world organized around. One of the major figures in the fight against Jewish prostitution, which was considered to be a problem that originated in Galicia. Um, one of those women was Bertha Pappenheim. Bertha Pappenheim um, went to Galicia many times. She wrote that she thought that the lack of edu Jewish education um, for Orthodox girls was one of the causes of prostitution um, and that women were, girls were taught to imagine themselves as purely objects for marriage and from there to prostitution was a short step. In other words, I don't know how to, how to describe what Bertha Pappenheim was saying as anything other than radically feminist. She herself was an Orthodox Jewish woman from birth to death um, and herself had a, a, a home in Germany that was very similar to some of the homes that Sarah Schneer set up. Um, it, it had a lot in common with, let's say, the, the, the Krakow Teachers Seminary. She was on the board of Beis Yaakov. She met uh, Shmuel Friedlander, Leo, uh, I'm sorry, Deutschlander, um, at a conference in London in the 20s and got very involved in Beis Yaakov. She was in Krakow. She just narrowly missed meeting Sarah Schneer herself. Um, she was there to meet Sarah Schneer. Sarah Schneer died about a month before she showed up. Um, and she spent a few weeks there advising, um, advising the Beis Yaakov Committee on uh, issues relating to especially Jewish social work. She thought that Beis Yaakov should be training social workers. She herself died a few months after that visit. Um, so, and Beis Yaakov, evidence that Beis Yaakov was well aware of the role they played. A lot of their fundraising happened in Western Europe and the United States, and their office stationery, you can see this in the Joint Distribution Committee, their office stationery described themselves as a society for the protection of the moral purity of Jewish women and the education of Jewish women in Poland. It was very clear that they were fundraising on the, um, through their contacts in women's movements in the United States, London, Germany, various other places. And they were happy to use the education, the, the, the language of the fight against prostitution in order to raise mm -hmm. funds. They were actually, I mean, evidence that they actually considered themselves part of this world. Um, Deutschlander spoke at a conference um, in London about uh, prostitution. But there was another very, uh, in 1929, the same summer that the Shea was founded, there was a women's conference in Hamburg, a Jewish women's conference that was run by um, Pappenheim's group, so run by Orthodox women. And um, the, in the Beis Yaakov Journal, they complained that they hadn't been invited to that conference, which was very clearly a feminist conference. So despite the fact that in Poland, they had to protect their right, their flank, their right flank against criticism that they were too modern and too feminist. Um, and of course they said, we don't believe feminism. We don't believe in feminism. The, they, there are articles where they talk about women's rights. 
we don't believe in that because, I mean, their argument is interesting. We don't believe in that because there is no status to a Jewish individual. There's only the community and the family and the couple. And that's why Jewish women don't need the, the right to vote. We were very aware of feminist charges against orthodoxy. Nearly every issue of the Vesiakov Journal includes a defense against those modern accusations that orthodoxy is patriarchal. So I actually was surprised at how aware Beis Yaakov was of feminism, how willing they were to make alliances when it was convenient to them, how careful they were to distinguish their own project from the feminist project. But every once in a while, it seems to me that their language is very clearly feminist. There's one, Benos in particular had a, a um, had a, a front page ad in the Beis Yaakov journal, Tenu lanu achuza, give us our right, give us our share of the certificates to Palestine. And the quotation there is from the, you know, the story of the daughters of Tzlochad demanding their right to a share in the land of Israel. So if you can, and they said there's a gentleman's agreement about who gets the certificates and women lose out. So they're basically using feminist language, but they, they, couch it in biblical stories. And this is where, thank you, Benos Slavchad, for making that argument all those, you know, millennia ago. Um, they could be outrightly feminist when they needed to because the Bible provided them the warrant. But they were certainly more feminist in very real senses, leaving aside the rhetoric, than Beis Yaakov is today. Wow, thank you so much for sharing all of that. That's really fascinating. I had no idea the the extent of of the that partnership um or at least the association to other feminist groups um so you you just alluded to this uh and i wanted to ask now that we're you know celebrating the centennial 100 years uh how would you say that Bisiakov has evolved over the past 100 years um, especially in terms of, you know, what they teach in terms of gender discourse uh, and things like that. Talia, if you want to go first. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I think that the evolution of Beis Yaakov is obviously a very interesting topic considering I wrote a whole thesis about it. Um, I think um, when I when I went into my thesis originally, I, I this wasn't necessarily my motivating question, but one of the questions I was hoping would animate my thesis is, um, or at least time at the time was, kind of which is the um, real inheritor of Shneer's legacy? Is it the contemporary Beis Yaakov movement, or is it Ishibat Maharat and company? Um, and I think I basically came to the conclusion that it doesn't have to be an either or situation. Um, that kind of Sarsner as a historical figure is kind of at some point or another up for grabs to kind of however you want to interpret her. Um, and I think that it, there's, there are kind of completely legitimate and like kind of equal opportunity lines to connect her between the contemporary Beis Yaakov movement beyond just the name alone and it, more kind of in terms of um, the general um, kind of mission and the general idea of finding value in educating Orthodox girls um, in their faith um, and giving them, I mean, like Schneer's language was about like giving girls like fervor in Hashem and finding um, their place in in observing um, in a way that kind of men already had built in for them and that women needed to seek out. Um, well, at the same time, I think the fact that she did innovate on this kind of very widespread level that had not really been seen to quite the same extent in other um, movements and in other kind of historical periods, um, it does also kind of um, connect in fairly obvious ways to the contemporary movement to educate um, women um, such that they are trained for clergy roles um, in the Orthodox community um, and, and the kind of more broad um, expansion of 
girls' educational opportunities within the religious sphere, like learning Gemara. Um, which is not to say, like, without Sarshner, girls wouldn't have been learning Gemara, because in the 30s, like, Rabbi Soloveitchik at Maimonides School in Boston and Rabbi Lukstein at Ramaz in New York were teaching girls and boys in the same classroom, and girls were learning Gemara, or maybe not Gemara, but whatever, Mishnah Talmud at that point. Um, so I'm not trying to necessarily say that, like, either the contemporary Beis Yaakov world or the contemporary um, Maharat, Jofa, women's uh, expanded Jewish educational things um, would have happened had Sarshner not existed, um, but that the Beis Yaakov of Europe definitely paved the way for these movements to exist and for these um, different communities to find meaningful ways to educate girls in um, ways that make sense for them and their particular needs. Well, thank you. So thinking about the difference between Beis Yaakov and the interwar period and the Beis Yaakov today, I mean, I don't think it's that Sarah Schneer was, he was in certain ways a modern cosmopolitan Orthodox woman of the kind that is, you know, not quite the same anymore. But I think it's also interesting to think about it in terms of power. One of the um, differences is, is that in the interwar period, the crisis of girls' defection from orthodoxy, which is generally the way people start to tell the story about Pesiakov. So the fact that orthodox women, uh, teenagers, adolescents were leaving orthodoxy in droves um, meant that suddenly, and, um, you know, the Gera Rebbe famously said, I have thousands of Hasidic, you know, young men who are not finding women to marry. So um, that crisis meant that Orthodox women had power. Um, in other words, they were needed by the community. Suddenly, um, as opposed to, I mean, they just didn't care what the rabbis said about whether they can learn Torah. I mean, that was, so, you know, Rabbi Eliezer says, they're like, why would we want to learn Torah? In other words, the whole idea that the rabbis are supposed to control girls and women's access to Torah gets thrown out of the window when the girls say they're not interested. Um, and when what is needed is somebody who will interest them and will persuade them that this is a worthwhile activity. Um, and that particular power dynamic meant that men were willing to give up their time, their social capital, um, their energy to support women um, and to support the study of women. And this, the study of women in, in the Beis Yaakov in the interwar period was not described it was very rarely described as preparation for them to become wives and mothers. It was um, through the influence, I think, of, of Sarah Schneer's vision, it was described as girls learning Torah for its own sake. Um, the, the, the evident value of Torah study, which Sarah Schneer believed with every core of her being, um, was the reality in Beis Yaakov. If the rabbis permitted it because it was an emergency and unfortunately it's so sad, but you have to let girls learn, um, that was the rhetoric of the rabbis. It wasn't the rhetoric in Beis Yaakov because that, what was needed was a rhetoric that could mobilize girls and could interest them in orthodoxy again. Um, that, I think that because it was so successful, um, the power dynamic changed um, and the, the unique situation in which suddenly women had a certain kind of power just by being hard to get. We know how well that works. Um, uh, Beis Yaakov was so successful, the, the, the Gera Rebbe was saying, I, we, have, we have girls desperate to marry our young boys, to our, you know, our young men, our young Hasidim. Um, and the situation that we have now is that the entire field of girls' Torah study is totally mobilized to support the Torah education of men, husbands, etc. Um, and this happened probably in the 50s um, in Israel first uh, under the influence of the Chazan Ish and um, with the, the, the B'nai Barak, the Rabbi Wolf Seminary in B'nai Barak, where the rhetoric changed dramatically and women's Torah study was no longer celebrated for its own sake. 
um, but now mobilize toward the growth of Beis Yaakov that would provide employment for girls so that every young boy could study in Kolel till they're an old man. Um, and girls not only willingly accepted this, um, this is you know the legacy of Beis Yaakov, but this has now become the norm. Um, and now there's, let's say, an overabundance of eager young women willing and hopeful to play this role in, in someone else's great Torah study. Um, and the dynamic has entirely shifted. And with the shift of this dynamic, has, the power has shifted back into the hands of men who are now able to um, much more clearly delineate what they want out of uh, girls' education and to set the terms for that and to create a system in which girls are competing for e with each other to be um, more willing to support a man more, you know, richer, thinner, more beautiful, etc. cetera. Um, and whatever feminist energies there were in that movement have to go elsewhere. So I see it as a kind of prismatic breaking up between where Beis Yaakov is in, ended up and, um, and the energies of, young women discovering the pleasures and, and, and excitement and value and passion for learning Torah um, and wanting to do that, not just to serve uh, the, the Torah, the much more valued because obligated Torah study of a man. Um, they're not gonna find that in, Beis Yaakov, in a Beis Yaakov environment, environment, even though Beis Yaakov has to continue to satisfy women's intellectual desires once aroused. Um, that's also the legacy of, of Sarah Schneer. So that's how I see the dynamic having changed. I mean, there are many other factors, the slide to the right in the Orthodox community more generally, but really it's, there's a kind of economic analysis of how that all played itself out. And women basically just lost the upper hand in that particular market. Well, I might, I might complicate that a little bit. Um, I think kind of broadly, I, I agree with you, but um, a few years ago at the um, 80th uh, yurt site um, commemoration um, for Sarah Schneer, that was at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, um, I was able to go actually with a contingent from my high school, which was an interesting experience. Um, but um, one thing that like really struck me was that the beginning of the program was like a bunch of rabbis with long beards giving speeches, mostly uh, like railing against American materialism and against modern technology, which I thought was especially funny given that the stadium was sponsored by Metro PCS um, and that they were like on ginormous screens um, being uh, shot all over the stadium. But uh, kind of to the other point. Um, and these rabbis also were really focusing on without Sarah Schneer, the Bacharim would have had nobody to marry and oh, Sarah Schneer, mother, wife, she was neither, but whatever. Um, and uh, all Beis Yaakov's girls as mothers and wives and that's your only tough kid in life and blah, blah, whatever. Um, they said the, like, uh, the Memorial Kaddish um, and then they were like, okay, and now we will all leave to commence with the women's program. And you, it, I mean, I guess imagine a room of like 18,000 Beis Yaakov girls screaming and that's what it sounded like. Because um, everyone was like, yes, finally they're leaving and we can get Yay! to this thing. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry uh, I wasn't there. Yeah, oh, it was, it, was, it was really interesting. I, I could send you my notes. Um, but, <laughs> I would love to see them. Um, and then at the, in the women's program portion of it, um, the, the Revisons who spoke, many of whom were, I think, related to Vichna Kaplan um, or other of, of the kind of original American Beis Yaakov ladies, um, very much did not frame it at all in this, like, you, your Beis Yaakov education exists to serve men as much as, like, your Beis Yaakov education exists to, to develop you as a woman and to develop you as, admittedly, a future mother, but it was much less of a, something I noticed at least was that the rhetoric that the female speakers used was much less related to kind of the Beis Yaakov education in relation to men. Um, so I, I don't necessarily, obviously like that's kind of one anecdote. Um, so I don't, I don't know necessarily that that is no, like totally right. better, um, what you said. I, I think generally speaking, I, I do agree, but um, I, I think that it's perhaps a bit more nuanced. Yeah, and some of the tension that you talk about is what Beis Yaakov meant for the men in the movement and what it means for the women in the movement. There, there was always a certain tension uh, between the way, be between Sarah Schneer. Sarah Schneer never mentioned Rabbi Eliezer that I am aware of in any of her published writings. Though there's no doubt that she perfectly well knew Rabbi Eliezer 
Um, and she had to argue against um, when she was, what was she doing in all those public talks in the small towns when she was trying to start a base Yaakov? She was basically arguing with Rabbi Eliezer, but in her writing, she didn't. In her writing, she did not mention um, halachic discourse around women's Torah study. She very rarely spoke about the, the Jewish women's, uh, you know, role as wife or, or mother. For her, it was perfectly clear that Torah was uh, uh, the most beautiful, valuable, important thing for any human being. And Beis Yaakov girls were human beings, um, which was a radical thing to think. Feminism, the radical notion that women are people. That, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's Rabbi um, Eliezer. <laughs> I wanted to ask also, um, what do you what do you see towards the future? Uh, you're talking about how in the past it was it seems that um, there was more of an understanding of some sort of sense of equality feminism in running the show do you do you think that there's a chance that it will go back to that in the future um, I think Talia is the Naomi. future here <laughs> <laughs> well Naomi I'm interested to hear your thoughts first um you know Basiakov let the the genie out of the bag um Women are educated in some aspects of Jewish sources. They're better educated than their husbands and their brothers. Um, I think there's no going back. They're also um, making their way into the public sphere precisely because of these economic reasons um, that are part of the story of what happened to Beis Yaakov in the in, in, interwar period. Um, we're already seeing a lot of, I mean, I, I really think that the, the idea that Beis Yaakov can somehow impose itself as opposed to allowing um, the participants in its programs to shape it, I think that there, there has to be some, some uh, development that comes from within that isn't imposed from above. And what that development is you know, if you believe that whatever every soul was on Sinai and the Torah is what every single individual contributes to it, then there are contributions that continue to be made and that need to continue to be made. Um, and that, and there are some amazing, I mean, the Beis Yaakov principle that I had, Rabbi Aaron Reich, he stepped back and didn't talk about modesty. He kept that, you know, he, he modestly kept his own views to himself. He didn't talk about that kind of thing. He allowed certain cultures to develop, certain cultural phenomena to develop. Um, the fact that Beis Yaakov, you know, continues to make art, conti continues to remember its past. And uh, Talia's high school play about the letters from Krakow. Um, I think those, I think what happened in Krakow, however censored that story is, however domesticated with, you know, our mother, uh, Sarah, um, that there's something very explosive about Beis Yaakov origins that continues to set off little bombs everywhere. Um, and even if you go to the most conservative Beis Yaakov, somehow that message gets through. Um, it did to me, I think. Uh, I remember a, a number of years ago at this point, um, I went to a, a NOW conference, the National Organization for Women, um, and um, I, I forget, honestly, the context of the speech. I don't remember at all anything else, but I remember the president of now at the time um, was referencing, um, I think this was maybe like 2012, 2013, um, was referencing the um, kind of uh, rightward slide in American politics as the last puffs of the patriarchal dragon. <laughs> um, and I, I thought, I mean, it was imagery that stuck with me over these past number of years. And I think that it would be difficult to um, make that connection to Beis Yaakov um, or to make any discussion of a patriarchal dragon um, puffing its last breaths with relation to Orthodox Judaism. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I, I don't know that, I, I think that the Beis Yaakov world has um, I think the Beis Yaakov world is 
kind of like what I was saying before, trying to figure out where the balance between women's empowerment and orthodoxy as a, a patriarchal religion as, and as a patriarchal society, kind of how to find that balance and where to um, find expressions, um, outlets for ex personal expression. Um, and I think uh, kind of as Naomi was saying, um, the, the Beisakov world, Beisakov really does empower its students to take leadership roles and to take initiative and to sing and perform art and dance in ways that are not possible in a context outside of the Beisakov school, whether because, you know, at every Beisakov girl gets married when she's 18, or at least she's supposed to, and have kids, and clearly that means that you can't sing or dance anymore, um, but also just because, like, you can't it's it, according to the kind of strictures of that community, you can't do those things in mixed settings. Um, and I think in those ways and in the having the power of kind of the all all female classroom really does empower its girls to think critically about women's spaces, even if it's not necessarily quite so, um, even if it's not in quite so many words. Um, and I think in, in these ways, the Beisiako system is empowering its students in a lot of ways to um, be critics and to be thinkers and to exist as makes sense to them in the context that they're existing in, um, which I, I know is maybe a bit tautological, but um, I, I think you guys get what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, that definitely resonates. I didn't go to a base out of school, but I did go to an all girls high school. Uh, and I think that that was a very empowering experience for me in hindsight. Um, so we are almost out of time, but I wanted to ask if either of you have any last thoughts, uh, anything that we didn't discuss that you want to mention. It's funny, I, um, one of the things I did when I was doing research for this book is I went through the Shoah oral history archives, which are an amazing resource. You can just type in Beis Yaakov search near and it'll give you every interview in which he was mentioned, et cetera. And in the oral history archive interviews, when the last thing they say is, is there's something that you wanna add that hasn't been covered? And there was an Orthodox woman who said, I have something else to say. And they said, what do you have to say? And she said, I met Sarah Schneerer. That was what she said. <laughs> nice. That's, that's interesting. Um, I, I guess I, more broadly, like I, I think the engagement between Jofa and um, the Beis Yaakov history is a really interesting connection and I think a really important connection. Um, and I mean, as a, a women's history nerd and as as a Jewish history nerd and as a Jewish women's history nerd, um, I, I think, I mean, at least personally, I think it's, it's important for um, us as an Orthodox feminist community to kind of understand our roots and to understand kind of where we're coming from. And that means understanding Sarah Schneer. It may, means understanding Salvechik and Lukstein and all the other kind of factors that brought us to where we are now. And like Blue Greenberg also. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's important. And I think it's honestly a really exciting thing that we have a centennial this year and that we are kind of convening as Orthodox feminists to celebrate Sarah Schneer. And obviously, I, I don't know what uh, what Sarah Schneer is thinking looking down from Shemayim at us. Um, but I, I hope she's happy. <laughs> I think she is. Thank you so much. I Thank I you. share similar sentiments. I I hope that she's looking down and, and is happy with the work that we're doing and um, and this conversation that we're having. Um, so thank you both so, so much for sharing your insights, your research, your, your thoughts, your feelings about uh, all of these topics. Um, it's really been fascinating for me. Um, I feel like I learned a lot. Uh, and thank you to all of our viewers. I hope that you also enjoyed this dynamic discussion. Um, and I also want to put a plug out there um, that not only did we have this webinar in honor of the centennial, but we're also having a learnathon. I'm going to uh, attach a, a link to this video on Facebook um, to sign up really just for 
any any sort of chapter, um, anything that, that you were learning uh, to dedicate it in honor of this centennial. Uh, there's also a space there to talk about um, and share meaningful stories of Jewish education and women's empowerment, um, whether you went to Beis Yaakov School or not. Uh, and we hope that you will uh, join us in, in learning. And thank you once again. So thank you, Talia and Naomi. And thank you, Rivka, for, for moderating. Yeah, thank My you. Pleasure. It's so and beautiful. Thank you for bringing it back to Jofa, Talia. That was nice. All right. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>